Um, this is a paper I wrote for presentation at a, a conference of the American Catholic Philosophical Association. They must know I'm not Catholic, but they've invited me twice, just the same. Uh, I often puzzled over why, and I think the explanation is they know I believe in old-fashioned things like truth and virtue and so on, as they do. Okay, not for the same reasons, perhaps. Anyhow, the first time the meeting, the theme of the meeting was interpretation. And I said, is it okay if I write about misinterpretation? Is that acceptable? And they said, oh, sure. And this time, 15 years later, the theme of the conference was virtues. And I said, is it okay if I write about a vice? And they just chuckled and said, oh, fine, go ahead. So that's what I did. Okay. Now, do I have this? Yes. Okay. That's my city. <laughs> this is yours. Oh, I, am, I am so nostalgic for shops that sell real fruit. And, uh, I, I miss greengrocers, I can't tell. Okay. I'm taking as my motto this from W.K. Clifford, British mathematician. Famous paper from the late 19th century called The Ethics of Belief. It's the paper to which William James is replying in The Will to Believe. And here is one of my favorite lines from this very nicely written paper. The credulous man is father to the liar and the cheat. As we will see, he's <laughs> exactly right. Um, to be clear, I needed to say this to my first audience. Though I'm speaking about credulity and circumspection, the focus will be primarily on the, on the vice, not on the virtue. And though I have a long-standing interest in epistemological virtues, this isn't a kind of virtue epistemology, as that phrase is used at the moment. Okay, there is a, a little clique that does what it calls virtue epistemology. I am not a member and have no interest in joining, but I am interested in epistemic virtues. So. And while my motto comes from the ethics of belief to which James was responding in, in that famous paper, The Will to Believe, I'm going to talk about epistemology, about science, about education. I'm not going to talk about religion. I have nothing to say on that question. Okay, so here are some words my students don't understand. Perhaps you all do, but I use these words in class and they go like, duh. So. Pejorative. Sometimes they say that means demeaning, which is kind of troubling. Demeaning. Tendentious. They have no idea what that means. Do you? Yeah, okay. And, yep, you guessed it. Credulous. They have no idea what credulous means. Um, I'm struck by the pattern here. It looks as if they were shielded for their whole lives from terms of negative epistemological appraisal, um, as if that really was demeaning. You can't say. Um, yes, I understand you believe this, but I'd like to know whether you have any evidence. That's supposed to be rude and demeaning. Okay. Here are some words. I like, I like to joke. I'm bilingual in... British English and American English. My American accent is still terrible, but uh, okay. there are a lot of words which have different meanings in the two idiolects, not their idiolects, but dialects, whatever you call them. Um, lift, uh, which of course I'm, I'm explaining this to Americans, in British means elevator or ride. Okay, give me a lift, no, give me a ride. Um, rubber, which is a word I have to be very careful about. Um, <laughs> eraser in British, but that's not what it means in American. Ring for to call someone on the telephone. Knock up, um, which 
in American English means get pregnant. <laughs> in British English means call on. Um, this one's sort of philosophically interesting. Quite in British English can mean fairly or absolutely. In American it can only mean absolutely. Um, I remember the first time I gave a paper in the US and somebody in the audience said that was quite good. I was quite offended. <laughs> um, and disinterested, which uh, to my British ear can never mean uninterested. They're different. But in America, it can mean either. And, yep, <laughs> also credulous. Okay, I have two dictionaries on my shelf. They're sort of Bibles where when I'm not sure which language I'm speaking. I look it up to see. Okay, what, what is it in which language? If you look up credulous in Merriam-Webster, which is the standard American dictionary, it says, ready to believe, especially on slight or uncertain evidence, which is not inherently pejorative. There's nothing negative about it, it's just descriptive. But in the OED, which is the standard English dictionary, it says, too ready to believe, gullible, which is pejorative, does have a negative connotation. However, when you get to credulity, they're identical, essentially. The American Dictionary says, undue readiness to believe, and the English, English Dictionary says, excessive readiness to believe. Um, in case you're wondering about gullible, um, my my audience in DC had, didn't know gullible. I guess they didn't read Shakespeare. Uh, it's, it's a, to gull someone, of course, is to trick them or deceive them. Apparently, it's based on gull's ability to swallow an enormous quantity of food at one go. Um, as far as I can tell, that one's about to eat a rabbit, which is almost <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Okay, why is credulity an epistemological vice? Well, vices contrast with virtues, right? And a virtue, what's a virtue? A virtue is a desirable character trait, a strength of character. You know it comes from the Latin word vir, which means man. Okay, so it's strength is the key thought. So vice is an undesirable character trait, that's to say a weakness of character. Why credulity, why is credulity a weakness of character? Well, it's a weakness of character specifically with respect to a person's response to evidence. They don't respond right to evidence. Hence, it's an epistemological vice. What makes it epistemological is that it's a relation to evidence. It's also, as Alexander Bain said, a natural human tendency. Um, Bain described our intellectual development as innate credulity tempered by checks. You've probably never heard of Alexander Bain, have you? Um, he's not just famous for having the biggest sideburns in history, though they are pretty impressive. He was uh, very interesting, I think, Scottish. I um, don't know whether to call him a psychologist or philosopher. He was somewhere in between. Psychology and philosophy of mind were not clearly distinguished at this point. Okay. He was somewhere in between. He was also, um, according to Peirce, the grandfather of pragmatism because it was his ideas about belief that kicked Peirce off in the first instance. Um, Richard Dawkins described small children as information caterpillars. Um, that's to say, little kids just innocently absorb whatever they hear, anything. Right? They have no discrimination. They don't need discrimination at that point in their lives, they just need to take stuff in. Um, so describing a three-year-old as credulous is not to criticize him. I think it's just natural when you're three. 
You might say credulity is a grown-up vice. It's a vice for adults. So, I'm being very charitable. The American usage covers both child and adult. The British applies only to those who've reached intellectual maturity. Okay. Who should have learned not every informant can be trusted. Um, why a butterfly? Well, because what's good food for caterpillars is not good food for butterflies. You might construe credulity on an Aristotelian model. It's very tempting, um, in accordance with the doctrine of the mean. Uh, being too ready to believe would be the vice of credulity. Being too ready to dismiss ideas would be the vice of closed-mindedness. And being ready to believe only when you have sufficient evidence would be the virtue at the mean. Okay. This is the Goldilocks theory of credulity. Um, I think a quasi-Aristotelian approach seems right. But I also think that first attempt was too categorical because it seems to me both belief and the quality of evidence come in degrees. Belief can be stronger or weaker. Evidence can be better or worse. So a better story would be being too ready to believe or ready to believe more strongly than your evidence warrants. That's credulity. Being too ready to dismiss ideas or too ready to disbelieve or too ready to believe less strongly than your evidence warrants that's closed-mindedness. And proportioning the degree of your belief to the strength of your evidence, that's what I mean by circumspection, is the virtue at the mean. Um, it's a lot of work to spell this out. A hell of a lot of work. But I'm, I'm lucky. I have the tools to hand because my account of the quality of evidence is already inherently and all the way through gradational. Evidence can be better or worse, stronger or weaker. And in my account of belief, at the first level we have dispositions to behave verbally and otherwise, and they can be stronger or weaker. Dispositions can be stronger or weaker. Um, I had a moment of eek, I must be wrong, but I eventually persuaded myself, no, this wasn't a mistake. If belief involves dispositions, readiness to believe is a disposition to form dispositions. Right? That sounds weird, but I don't think it is. I think, actually, we talk about second-order dispositions all the time. For example, um, you're familiar with old books, are you? You've taken old books out of the library. The paper has got yellow and brittle. It's a tendency of paper to get yellow and brittle with age. Now you might think we could define epistemic justification in terms of one epistemic virtue, circumspection. Um, the characteristic idea of virtue epistemology is we can define epistemic justification in terms of epistemic virtues. And for a moment it looked to me as if, hey, maybe they're right. At least you can define it in terms of one epistemic virtue, namely circumspection. To which I reply, well, yeah, you could. You could say a justified belief is a belief that was arrived at circumspectly. And it would be true. The trouble is, it would be purely verbal. All you're doing is just going around a string of words. You're not actually getting to anything real. It's not real until it's supplemented by an account of what makes evidence stronger or weaker. And if you've got that, you've already got an account of justification, so you don't need this particular twiddle about the exercise of the virtue of circumspection. Um, I hate to say this, but this light is driving me crazy. Can we switch it off? Um, it's, 
It's just distract, you know, it's, it's distracting me the whole time. Can we just kill it? No? <laughs> um, oh, okay, thank you, that's much better. Okay, thank you. Now you have my full attention, yay. Um, circumspection doesn't mean you have to become a skeptic. It doesn't mean you have to refuse to believe anything you can't check for yourself. It does mean you have to use your head about whom to believe and on what subject. Here's Clifford again. In order that we may have gr the right to accept someone's testimony as grounds for believing what he says, we must have reasonable grounds for trusting his veracity, that he's really trying to speak the truth so far as he knows it. His knowledge, that he's had opportunities of knowing the truth about this matter, and his judgment, that he's made proper use of these opportunities in coming to the conclusion which he affirms. You might put that in more modern terms as, you, you don't believe someone unless you have reason to think, A, he's sincere in what he tells you, and B, he knows what he's talking about. Think about asking for directions. Um, oh, yeah, I, when I came here, I didn't know which side of the road you drive, drove on. Um, this is actually a picture of a British roundabout, and you show it to an American audience, and they go, what? Don't get it. Um, well, okay, you're going around on the left. Um, you've asked for directions, and the guy in the back seat says, take the second exit. Oops. Sorry, I meant the first. You'll have to go round again. Look, I said I was sorry. Okay. Um, that tells you when you ask for directions and you follow the directions you're given, you're actually making a lot of assumptions about whether the person is telling you the truth and whether he knows what he's talking about. Um, this is very vivid to me because I spend a lot of time professionally in South America and in some countries in South America, machismo demands that if someone asks you directions, you give them directions, whether you have any idea how to get to the place or not. <laughs> so you have to watch out when men give you confident directions. They may not know what they're talking about. So we may ask, does he have a motive to deceive us? Was he actually present? Is he visually impaired? Did he change his story when he heard what other people said? Um, of course, no common sense precautions can guarantee we won't be taken in by liars, cheats, scammers, charlatans, the self-deceived, the self-promoting, and the confused or the ill-informed. I loved writing that list. There are no guarantees. Sorry, no one can guarantee this. You may not be familiar with this flower. It's called the protea. It's a South African flower. Um, it comes in a bazillion varieties. These are just a tiny sample. Some people are naturally more credulous than others, I think. Some are credulous with respect to a certain kind of claim. For example, <coughs> political claims. Claims about medical treatment, claims about diet, investment prospects, lottery odds. Um, I'm fascinated by ads that we see on TV in the States all the time for diet pills that will enable you to lose large quantities of weight without starving yourself, without exercise, and with absolutely no danger whatsoever. And I'm thinking to myself, does anybody believe this? I mean, what kind of a fool accepts that kind of claim? But people do, obviously, because it's worth spending money on television advertisements for. Some with respect to sp supposedly miraculous occurrences. Oh my goodness, we had a famous toasted cheese sandwich in <laughs> Miami. <laughs> um, it did look remarkably like Mother Teresa, I grant you, it did. 
But honestly, I mean, why, why anybody thinks it's a miracle as opposed to a coincidence? Anybody thinks it's really worth putting this thing in a glass case to preserve it? Oh my goodness. Or these are also quite common claims that someone just saw Elvis at the local supermarket. Or, now I'm getting really serious, to universities and other institutions self-promoting publicity materials. Um, I'm afraid I get some document from some part of the University of Miami about excellence and prestige. My reaction is, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. And some people, I think a lot of people, including a lot of people who call themselves skeptics or scientific skeptics because they go poo-poo about religious claims, alleged sightings of the Loch Ness monster, homeopathic remedies and all that. A lot of people are credulous about science. They just believe anything that has the label scientific slapped on it. That's a form of scientism. And now I have to add, uh, thanks to Ladyman and Ross, who wrote uh, a paper called Everything Must Go, which I shall talk about briefly this evening. And Alex Rosenberg, who wrote an even worse book called The Atheist's View of Reality. See, he thinks he speaks for all atheists. God, I hate these guys. Um, I think Rosenberg's is the worst book I have read in a very long time. Anyhow, Ladyman and Ross and Rosenberg all describe their own positions as scientism. They don't seem to realize that the word is now and has been for more than a century pejorative. It carries a negative connotation. It means being too deferential to science. I think Clifford has slight tendencies to scientism. He is surprisingly confident that he's entitled to believe what a scientist tells him about something in his, that's to say the scientist's, field. His professional training, Clifford writes, is one which tends to encourage veracity and the honest pursuit of truth and to produce a dislike of hasty conclusions and slovenly investigation. I have quite reason enough to believe that the verification is within the reach of human appliances and powers, and in particular that it's actually been performed by my informant. And his result is watched and tested by those who are working in the same field to which I want to say, you wish. This is optimistic to say the least. Perhaps it's simply old fashioned. Perhaps it really was true in 1877, but it certainly isn't true now. Um, this is by my light scientism. Not that I'm denying that the sciences have been very successful. Sure they have, but science is imperfect untidy, fallible, susceptible to corruption, even to fraud, especially now with so much pressure on scientists. Get grants, publish. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there is a very strong tendency at the moment, for example, for scientists to divide their publications into little thin slips. You know, the smallest publishable unit they talk about you make, if you do one experiment and you get interesting results, you'll make five papers out of it, not just one, because that way you have five publications on your CV. Okay. Um, it's called salami publishing, because you chop up the work into little slices. Moreover, the whole scientific enterprise depends on a mesh of justified mutual confidence, every thread of which is fragile and it will break if an instrument's found to be faulty, if credentials are found to be worthless, if peer review is found to be pub corrupted. And of course, no scientist could ever test all of those threads. I'm sorry to say, peer review is badly corrupted. Um, 
I told one story about this last night. I'll tell a different one today. There's a recent article by a Harvard medical scientist who wrote 304 slightly verbally different versions of one paper. It was a spoof paper. As he said, anybody with a grasp of high school chemistry would have known that this was bullshit. This couldn't possibly be correct. He submitted it to 304 electronic journals in his field. The responses varied. Some journals said, we'd be happy to publish your paper. Please send a check for $200 to cover publication costs to this bank account in Bangladesh or wherever it was. Right. Um, he said, I tossed all those. <laughs> um, of the ones who didn't ask for money, fully half accepted this paper um, and were perfectly willing to publish it and allegedly had had it refereed, okay. even though, he said, anybody who was remotely competent would know it was bullshit. It shows you what peer review can be worth. Um, okay. Donald Campbell, who is sadly no longer alive, but he was a notable psychologist in his day, had a very interesting model of how this, this justified mesh of confidence is possible, even though no scientist can know everything about the work of every other. He called it the fish scale model. And what he meant was, scientist X knows about this and enough about the neighboring field to judge it. And this guy knows the neighboring field and enough about the next one to judge it, and so on. And between, among themselves, they can cover everything, even though no individual can. I looked up fish scale model on Google Images. I got all kinds of boring tables and graphs and other photographs of Campbell. And then I found this wonderful thing, which is, of course, nothing to do with the case, but what a delightful frog. Hey? We need to be aware, scientific claims fall on a kind of epistemological continuum from the very well warranted to the highly speculative. I would be very surprised if the theory of evolution turned out to be false. It's possible, but I'd be very surprised. Because at this point in time, the evidence which has now accumulated is extremely strong. Other claims are just pure speculation, and most of those will probably turn out to be false. Moreover, there can be experimental error, there can be confirmation bias, there can be bad study design, there can be failure to screen out interfering factors, and so on. Um, I know more than I wish I did about bad science, because one of my specialties in the law is scientific testimony. And all kinds of utter crap under the guise of science is presented in court. And if you study these cases, you get very good at spotting very bad epidemiological study designs, for example, which are quite common. Think of, do you remember Vioxx? No? Um, I don't know whether it was Solomon Island, and if it was, I don't know under what name, but okay. It was a drug for arthritis pain. It was, in its day, a blockbuster drug. Why? Because the usual drugs for the pain of arthritis are very damaging to the stomach. They're apt to give you bleeding ulcers. Vioxx worked in a completely different way from all the previous drugs and didn't have those bad effects on the stomach. It genuinely didn't. Okay. Uh, the Vigor study, which was the first big clinical study that they did of Vioxx, was very carefully designed. 
it tracked the gastrointestinal effects, I say the effects on the stomach, for longer than it attracted the effects on the heart and the vascular system. And when several of the people given Vioxx dropped dead of heart attacks and strokes late in the program, they said that was outside the study period, doesn't count. So they didn't include them in the results that they published. Um, Merck made, I don't know how many billions of dollars, they made an enormous profit on this drug. But four years later they had to withdraw it from the market because it was discovered to be causing heart attacks and strokes all over the place. It's actually quite a dangerous drug. There are, there is a remaining drug of the same class Celebrex, still on sale in the US. If you look at the ads for it, you will notice um, they show these old codgers happily cycling along, right? They're all loose, right? All their joints work, they don't have arthritis pain, they can do anything, right? And they're whistling as they cycle around these cycle paths. But if you look at the edge of the cycle path very carefully, if you're eyes are not too hot like mine, you have to get rather close to the TV, but if you get close you see the edge of the cycle path is actually writing and it says, warning, may cause heart attacks, strokes, other vascular problems. Even reliable evidence can be misleading as in the case of Raymond Easton. Um, no, that is not a picture of Mr. Easton. Uh, it's okay. Mr. Easton was charged, he's an Englishman, charged and convicted and sent to prison in England on, for a, an armed robbery, hence the picture. How did they identify him? By DNA. They had his DNA profile on, on file because he'd been convicted of a domestic violence offence years before. And they had DNA from the crime scene. And there was a match. In the way that they ordinarily do a match, there was a match. So they arrested him, they tried him, they convicted him. The whole thing was completely mad. He was suffering from an advanced stage of Parkinson's disease. He couldn't get out of bed without help. He couldn't dress himself. He certainly couldn't drive. And Parkinson's gives you terrible shakes. So one thing he absolutely couldn't do was hold a gun convincingly and point it at anybody. Um, eventually, he was set free on the grounds that it couldn't possibly be him and somebody had the wit to do a slightly more detailed DNA test and indeed at the slightly more detailed level it wasn't a match. But DNA evidence is re as reliable as forensic evidence gets. Still it was misleading. However, life is short. You're going to live forever, right? But there isn't time to check out everything. So what do you do? What are you to do? I would say check out, first of all, information that's a matter of personal concern to you. Okay. If it's a question of what medical treatment I'm going to have or somebody I care about is going to have, I will look into it very carefully. And things it's your special responsibility to know about. So. There are certain things a physician has to know about, or a judge, or an attorney, or a pilot, or a professor. Okay. Those are the things that you put the effort into. All right. The credulous man is a danger to himself. Why? Because he's so easily taken in by con men, fakers, liars, cheats, charlatans, self-promoters, the self-deceived, etc. I love writing that list. We're surrounded by these people. We're just surrounded by them. So. And 
what's worse, he's also a danger to society. For one thing, epistemological habits are infectious. They get passed on to children and to students. A credulous professor can do a lot of damage because he passes on this vice to his students. Worse, as Clifford saw, credulous people create the market for the con men, the cheats, etc. Why? Well, because the more people are more easily taken in, the likelier it is that charismatic but nutty politicians will gain power that fake cures will sell, that juries will convict or acquit on other bases than the evidence, and so on. Okay. Here are some examples. That's Robert Mugabe, um, president of Zimbabwe, used to be called the breadbasket of Africa because it was the most successful agricultural economy in the continent. And now the people are starving. And moreover, the sewers don't work in Harare. And oh my goodness, it's a disaster. And yet they keep re-electing him. He's crazy as a loon, as far as I can tell. But they keep re-electing him because he's sort of charismatic. Okay. There's another one. Dr. Schmoo's original Indian snake oil. Okay. Remedy for all diseases. I'm going to be specific now. First of all, the legal system. Jurors believe eyewitnesses, especially confident eyewitnesses, even though we have an enormous amount of evidence that eyewitnesses cannot be trusted. They're just hopelessly unreliable. According to the Innocence Project, oh, okay, you don't know about this, I take it. You don't have the death penalty, right? No. Okay. No. In some states in the U.S., we still do, including Florida. And many U.S. law schools now contribute to something called the Innocence Project, which provides legal resources for people who claim that they have been wrongly convicted and want their cases reopened. Right. They will first sift through them to see which ones they think potentially have merit, um, which are often those that involve DNA which was not tested at the time but which could be tested now. They've, had, they've exonerated a kind of scary number of people, many of whom were on death row, okay. um, one or two of whom had already been executed. And they say, the leading cause of false convictions is unreliable eyewitness testimony. Jurors are also very credulous about supposed experts. Oh my goodness. James Grigson, he was known in Texas as Dr. Death. Why? Because in Texas, before you can sentence someone to death, there has to be a hearing after he's convicted of the crime where the jury is asked, among other things, do you believe beyond a reasonable doubt that there is a probability that he would be dangerous in future? Okay, I have no idea what that means. Beyond a reasonable doubt there is a probability? What does he mean? I asked my law students, the best answer I got was definitely maybe. Right. Uh, Dr. Grigson testified in hundreds of death penalty cases in Texas. Texas executes the most people in the country. And every time when he was asked, would this person be dangerous in future, he said, sure, I'm 100% confident. He sent untold numbers of people to their death. Um, on the basis of something which I don't believe anybody can predict. Okay. And anyway, I thought we executed people for what they did, not for what they might do in the future. But never mind, don't get me started on the constitutional issues. Including forensic witnesses like, oh God, the knife mark examiner. Okay, I'm getting anecdotal. Um, if you'd told me 
when I first went to Miami as a philosophy professor, within 15 years I would be involved in trying to get somebody off death row in Florida. I would have just laughed. But I did. Okay. <coughs> I found myself in the law school. I found myself teaching law students about scientific testimony. And then I found a public defender in my office saying, look, it's Mr. Ramirez's third trial. It's a third appeal. He has been convicted three times on the testimony of a knife mark examiner who said, I can identify this knife to the exclusion of every other knife in the world as the one that made the, vic the, the, the wound in the victim's neck. Come off it. It's not a knife with blood on it. It's not a knife with a it's not a knife that's damaged in some distinctive way. It's a knife such that there are a million of them in the world. He has no way of distinguishing it. But Ramirez had been convicted three times on the basis of this. Appealed three times. After I got involved, but only in part, of course, due to my help, he got another new trial and the death penalty was taken off the table. So we actually got him off death row. So we didn't get him out of jail, and I don't think we ever will. All right. It's not only jurors, it's also attorneys and judges who are credulous. Judges are completely credulous about statistical significance. A lot of them are credulous about peer review, including the Supreme Court of the United States. Second context, the university. I think, I hope you do too, our universities, no less than the courts, are vital social institutions. They're really very important. But the way universities are run is, has changed dramatically in the course of my working life. It used to be that the administrators of a university were academics, they were professors, who had said, OK, look, for five years I will do this administrative crap. It's boring, but somebody's got to do it. I will do it for five years, and then I can get back to my work in the classroom. Okay. They were, some were good, some were bad, most were middling but they all had some sense of what our work is really about. Now, almost all American universities, I don't know about Irish ones, are managed by professional administrators. That's their career ladder. They, had, they, were, they were not professors, or if they were, it was a million years ago, they have no intention of ever going back to the classroom or the laboratory. They've completely lost touch with what academic work is like and can't judge it. So instead, they just look at surrogate measures like rankings and the prestige of the journals you publish in and yada, yada, yada. And the result is a steady erosion of what I think of as academic virtues, including circumspection. Uh, Think, for example, what's involved in judging a department by how it's ranked by some external outfit. Right. I gather this may well be of some relevance to you. Um, who are these people? Well, we don't know. And moreover, they're not accountable. I mean, they make judgments, judgments but we don't know who they are, and they can't be held responsible for what they say. And eventually, professors start thinking, well, that's what matters. Uh, my judgment of what matters isn't worth anything. What really matters is what those guys think, whoever they are. Okay. Philosophy? Well, OK. I think philosophy professors are less credulous than the average about toasted cheese sandwiches and that kind of thing. But I think 
especially of late, many are kind of credulous about the sciences. Um, I'll talk about that tonight, enough. Okay. For example, I think a lot of philosophy professors these days are drawing very large conclusions from one or a tiny number of very small scale psychological studies uncritically accepted. Um, too many, too many. I don't know how many, but too many. I'm not suggesting it's only science about which we're credulous, no. I think actually there's a sort of culture of professional credulity. Um, as you can tell, I can't resist the allure of alliteration. Mm -hmm. So I think philosophy professors are credulous about rhetoric, references, reputations, recommendations, and rankings. Rhetoric. Oh boy, everybody has to write abstracts and proposals these days. Um, I can't do it. I can't write an abstract until I've finished the paper. But other people just write the abstract and then, you know, okay, then they write the paper. I don't get it. How do they do it? I don't know how it's going to come out until I've done the work, but they apparently do. Proposals are even worse because then you have to write an abstract of the work that you're going to do, explaining what the brilliant results are going to be before you've done it. Right? And you also have to explain how important this work is. And so you have to boast about how important it's going to be, again, before you've ever done it. Um, everybody overstates the case in these things. They always say, I've shown that P. Well, they haven't. They've only offered some arguments in favor of P. And for some reason, people take these things seriously. Don't ask me why. References. Oh, dear. I mean, citations. Do you call them references? Yes? Okay. Footnotes. Um, okay. One philosopher borrows his footnotes from somebody else, and nobody ever checks. So mistakes just get passed on and passed on and passed on. So as a student of mine figured out a couple of years ago, um, it's very common to hear Peirce's idea of abduction identified with inference to the best explanation. This can't possibly be right, because according to Peirce, abduction is the first stage of inquiry. And according to Harman, Inference to the best explanation is the last stage of inquiry. They cannot be identical. Anybody who knows anything about Peirce knows this. But it's everywhere in the literature. And I had a student who got really fascinated by this and tracked the whole literature down. And he discovered, first of all, Harman, who invented the phrase inference to the best explanation refers to a whole bunch of people who had the, allegedly had the idea before, including Peirce, and gives absolutely no references whatsoever. Great. That's Princeton for you. Yeah. We're so important, we don't have to give references. And then Paul Thagard, who was trained at Princeton, adopts this from Hartman, and Peter Lipton adopts it from Fagard, and so it goes on until the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the online encyclopedia of philosophy, makes the same claim. Um, and it's all based on exactly nothing. <laughs> exactly nothing except Harman says so. Um, and Harman is, I believe, the guy with the sign on his office door which says, just say no to the history of philosophy. So. Everybody knows, or we ought to, letters of reference and book blurbs are often laughably exaggerated. Um, I've read reference, le letters of, of reference for you know, perfectly ordinary candidates for tenure. You know, they're okay. They've published a few articles, for heaven's sake. Always like Wittgenstein. Give me a break. He's not like Wittgenstein. He's just okay. 
Um, I, what I don't understand is even people who write such things themselves take others' exaggerations seriously. That puzzles me, but they do. Okay. Uh, okay. We all know some reputations are earned by excellent work, others are not. Some are the result, for example, of association with a prestigious department. And yet, we easily assume everybody who's a name is worth reading. Not true. Some people are names for bad reasons. Why was, okay. Why was there, why were there scare quotes around prestigious? Because I hate that word. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Um, it's everywhere in university bump, everywhere. I hate it. Why? It's now a foam rubber public relations word. It's meaningless. We've forgotten its root. Its root is prestidigitation, conjuring, slate of hand. Right? And now prestige is the goal of every university. UK, this won't do anything for you, except you might like The Simpsons a bit. Um, in, I don't think you're subject to this, but uh, in the US there is something called the Philosopher's Gourmet Report, which is a ranking of philosophy graduate programs published every couple of years. What's it based on? As far as I can tell, it's based on information about which alleged star has moved from A to B and on gossip. How do I, why do I say this with some confidence? Because I've been asked to take part in it several times. I can tell you what the email is saying. We want you to act as an evaluator for this report. I will tell you what it says. We would like you to rank the following 80 departments, PhD granting departments, in order of merit from 1 to 80, in the following areas, philosophy of logic, uh, epistemology, pragmatism, I think it was philosophy of science. You have 10 days. That's absurd. It can't be done. I have, I have acted as an external evaluator for a PhD program in Canada, for example. It took me something like six weeks simply to work my way through the CVs of all the professors and to read, read some samples of their work to get some idea of its quality, to look at the, what the program was like um, what the success rate in finding PhDs, jobs was, and so on. This is nonsense. And yet, virtually every PhD depart granting department in the States, mine included, is obsessed with these wretched rankings. All they care about is going up in the rankings. My colleagues get furious with me when I say, look, it makes absolutely zero difference to my life how the department at the University of Miami is ranked. None. I don't care. And besides, I think the rankings are stupid. Uh, but they are obsessed, like everybody else. Okay. <gasps> I'm almost done. I'm sorry, we started late, so... Can you stand it? Can you sit it? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. We talk about the formation of character. Uh, I think... The virtues, here is just a, a, a list, not quite at random. Courage, fortitude, persistence, patience, kindness, and so on. And vices, again, the list is not entirely random. Cowardice, lack of resolve, impatience, cruelty, inconsiderateness. I think they're probably partly innate temperament. They're also partly learned. 
Uh, I'm sort of obsessed with Google Images and I tried to find something for formation of character. This was the best I could do. It's kind of nice. What can we do to curb credulity and encourage circumspection? In ourselves, in our students. Clifford's helpful again. But, says one, I am a busy man. I have no time for the long course of study which would be necessary to make me in any degree a competent judge of certain questions, or even to understand the nature of the argument. To which Clifford replies, then he has no time to believe. Meaning, if you're in that position, you're not entitled to believe anything. Okay. Um, I keep going back to this passage because this is the kind of thing my dean says to me regularly. I'm a busy man, I haven't got time to look into this, I just look at the rankings. And I want to say, then you have no time to believe, Dean. Uh, so, I should pick my battles, I should look carefully into the questions that matter, for the reasons that I discussed earlier. And with respect to claims I haven't looked into, I should just frankly acknowledge I don't know. That's not easy, especially if you're a professor, because we're supposed to know stuff, right? But, as Spinoza said, all excellent things are as difficult as they are rare. So, admitting you don't know gets easier with practice. Um, I can tell you, because I've been, you know, at first I had to be a bit self-conscious about it, and <coughs> I don't know. Um, but it gets less embarrassing as you get more used to it. And I discovered you learn a lot this way. Why on earth is there that picture? Okay, I'll tell you why. As I told you, I teach a class on scientific testimony in the law school. And one year, we were talking about fingerprint testimony. And now, I, I knew quite a lot about it. I could tell them, for example, did you know this? A latent fingerprint, which means the kind of thing you leave behind at a crime scene, amounts on average to roughly 20% of one complete fingerprint. Okay, so the identifications you're making are on the basis of very incomplete information. And one of my students said, you know, if you, if you watch CSI or any of those bazillion offshoots of CSI, they're always using this computer program, right? Where you've got the target print on one screen and then a whole bunch of other ones go by and all of a sudden the computer goes match, match, match. How does that work? He asked. How does, how does it work? I had to say, I have no idea. I haven't a clue. Um, all I can tell you is I will do my best to find out by next week, and you should try too, in case you succeed, and I don't. Okay. We found out. It was mainly me, but not entirely me. Okay. And the answer is very illuminating. Before you put the target print in the machine, that's the one from the crime scene, into the machine, you, the fingerprint examiner, have to mark it up with the things that you want the computer to look for. You don't just stick it in raw. You have to mark it. Look for this world, this arch, right? this bifurcation, and so on. Do you understand? Moreover, the computer will not kick up one print that's a match. It will kick up maybe 20, maybe sometimes as many as 40 prints that are potential matches. And the fingerprint examiners have to decide which, if any of these, it really matches. So, you see why this is so illuminating? 
you get the impression from CSI that this is an objective process. It's done by a machine. It doesn't involve any human judgment. That's false. It does. It's uh, what the machine does, doesn't. But making an identification on that basis involves a lot of human judgment and hence possible human misjudgment. Well, I was so happy and I was so glad I'd said I have no idea. How can we help students avoid credulity? Well, it would help if they understood what the word meant. Um, it would also help if you could get across to them, it's not demeaning to ask someone for the evidence for a claim. Nor is it demeaning to say, well, I don't think that evidence is really sufficient to be as confident as you seem to be. That's not demeaning, that's simply helping them learn. Also, I think more importantly, um, we need to do whatever we can to instill what Clifford calls a dislike of hasty conclusions and slovenly investigation. He thinks all scientists take this in with their mother's milk. I think that's grossly over-optimistic. But he's absolutely right that this is what we want to instill. Okay. I don't want to catch one of my students doing what Harmon did and making a claim about where this idea comes from on the basis of no information whatsoever. Um, which is why I'm a bit heavy-handed with them about footnotes. It's not instilled in every scientist, but actually I think the person who embodies this, this spirit, okay, let's go back to a dislike of hasty conclusions and slovenly investigation. The person who comes closest to this is a fictional character, interestingly enough. Have any of you read Arrowsmith? Best novel I have ever read about the scientific life. Um, Sinclair Lewis is usually um, a great parodist of Midwestern parochialism. This book, however, though it's in places laugh aloud funny, is a very serious piece of work about what it's like to be a scientist. Arrowsmith is a doctor, a medical scientist. And the guy, his teacher who inspires him is a Dr. Gottlieb, who is described in the book as so religious he would not accept quarter truths because they were an insult to his faith. This doesn't mean he was religious religious. It means he was so religious about respect for the facts that he would not accept any piece of work that was not meticulously conducted with meticulous controls, meticulous records. That's exactly what we should be trying to instill. It's an inspiring book. Um, by the way, Lewis says in the introduction that he had the help of a molecular biologist from Rockefeller University who worked with him on the novel to make sure that it wasn't off the wall about the scientific life. Um, and apparently this guy was so important he paid him 25% of the royalties. So. That's very interesting. Okay. We can help students understand what makes evidence stronger or weaker. For example, by discussing how to assess the websites or the newspapers they read, how to spot the tendentious. Um, actually, I ask my students, what newspapers do you read? And they go, huh? What's a newspaper? Uh, they get all their news from the internet. Uh, they, they don't, I mean, the idea that you might actually read a paper on paper is just foreign to them. But they don't have much sense of how to decide what's reliable stuff on the internet and how to decide what's just somebody spouting off. 
Uh, I have help in this matter. Okay, well, a law librarian. They're very unusual creatures. Um, they're not, not like regular librarians. Our law librarians all have to have a law degree. They all have to have worked as an attorney. And they have to have a degree in librarianship. First thing is, they're magic. They can find anything, including um, rulings by federal judges which have been removed from the internet. Uh, if you ask them, they can find them. Right? There are ways, apparently, but when I ask them how they find them, they say that's a trade secret. I can't tell you that, sorry. Uh, they also can tell you, and sometimes I consult them about this, what sources are, as they put it, citable. That means what sources you can put in the footnotes in a law review article, and it's acceptable. So Wikipedia is, uh, uh, no, not citable, right? <laughs> because you don't know who wrote it. And they, have, they actually have a list, and this has made me very conscious about judging sources and not just taking them for granted. And sometimes I will go to them with something that I read in the paper and say, I don't know if this is correct, but if it is, can you find me a citable source? The most important thing and the hardest thing is set a good example yourself. Uh, I think students learn at least as much from how you behave um, in your work and with respect to them and their work as they do from what you tell them. I'm not sure how much of what I tell them goes in. I am sure that they pick up habits that I have. So. Mine had better be good or they will pick up bad ones and I will be one of the in, typhoid Marys carrying these epistemological disorders into future generations. <gasps> I've had it. Okay. <laughs> um, as, as my host in Alicante said to me recently, ah, a la professora le gustan los gatos. <laughs> The professor likes cats. Yeah, I love cats. 